Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through passive range of movement testing for the cervical spine. The purpose of these tests is to see what happens when your patient's movement is not involving active contractile structures. For more information on passive range of movement testing, head over to our video titled Why We Test Passive Range of Movement, as this gives you the full clinical reasoning behind these tests. So as with all passive range of movement testing, there are three key things we need to look for. Pain, range, and end feel. And for passive range of movement testing of the cervical spine, it's also really important that you'll notice the therapist is using their body weight to control your patient's movement rather than just their hands. This allows the therapist's hands to remain relaxed and therefore really feel for what's going on in the movement. For example, is the rotation occurring from the upper cervical spine or the lower cervical spine? So bear this in mind when you're watching the video. Let's get into it. It's time to get clinical. So first we're going to look at passive cervical spine flexion. And for this test, the therapist is going to be standing behind the patient's head. And our handling is going to be in a web-like cradling fashion underneath the patient's occiput. So this is the position that we're going to assume now. And the importance of this for the patient is that it feels like their head is more supported in your hands. So for the movement, we're going to be simply drawing the patient's head from a neutral position with cervical spine flexion like so, as if we are bringing the patient's chin towards their chest. And we can do this a couple of times to get a good feel for the movement. In terms of our pain range and end feel, the main structures that can be irritated with this movement are discogenic structures. Uh, so if you uh, feel that the patient has, for example, increased pain down their arms, if they do present with neural irritation, this may be re reproduced in this movement. Other things to consider is that we are stretching the neck extensor muscles with this movement. And if you're familiar with our term pokey chin posture, then you'll be aware of that this is a particular posture where the cervical spine extensor muscles are very tight and therefore stretching them with this movement can be painful. Other soft tissue structures that we are affecting may include the ligamentum nuque. In terms of range of movement, the expected range of movement for cervical spine flexion is approximately 50 degrees. And as we said, with the movement, we should be able to bring the patient's chin to meet their chest. And finally, in terms of end feel, the expected end feel for this movement is a soft end feel. Even in other conditions such as osteoarthritis, the end feel is still expected to be soft because the facet joints in the cervical spine are in an open rather than in a closed position. One final thought to bear in mind is where the movement for cervical spine flexion is coming from. Is it coming from the lower cervical spine, the mid cervical spine, or the upper cervical spine. And the way we can assess this is by placing our hands in different areas to create the fulcrum around the lower cervical spine like so, the mid cervical spine like so, or the upper cervical spine like so. And when you're completing those movements, you can look to see if there is particular pain in either the mid, lower, or upper cervical spine, or if it feels more stiff in the mid, lower, or upper cervical spine, and this can tell you more about your patient's condition. So next, we're gonna be looking at cervical spine extension. And for this test, the therapist is standing in the same position as they were for the flexion movement, and the handling is also exactly the same, where the therapist is cradling underneath the patient's occiput. So to perform our extension movement, it's important to create some space uh, between yourself and the plinth so that the patient's head can be drawn in the gap and their head is over the edge to allow for you to take your patient's head into an extended position. And again, you may do this, you may do the movement a couple of times to get a feel for how the cervical spine is moving. In terms of our pain, range and end feel, starting with pain, the main point with cervical spine extension is that we are closing down the facet joints between cervical spine levels and therefore conditions such as osteoarthritis may present with more pain for cervical spine extension. The expected range of movement for cervical spine extension is 60 degrees and the expected end feel for this movement is hard as we are closing down the articular surfaces of the facet joints. <laughs> 
Finally, as we said with cervical spine flexion, it is important to test whether or not there are differences in extension between the upper cervical spine, the mid cervical spine, and the lower cervical spine. So as a therapist, what we can do is change our handling um, by bringing our hands more towards the upper cervical spine to have a fulcrum at this position to test upper cervical extension, bring our hands to the mid cervical spine to create the fulcrum for mid cervical spine extension, and then bring our hands to the very lower cervical spine to create the fulcrum for lower cervical spine extension. And by doing this, we are looking to see whether or not there are any differences in pain or range of movement between the upper, mid and lower cervical spine. If there is, as a therapist, you may choose to mobilize the stiff areas and see if this makes a difference to your patient's condition. And also, it might be important to encourage your patient to access more movement from the area that is more stiff to improve their symptoms. So now we're going to look at passive cervical spine rotation. As with the flexion and extension movements, the therapist is standing in the same position. In terms of our handling, we're still going to be forming a, a cradling movement underneath the patient's occiput, but rather than our hands being closer together, they may need to be a bit wider so that you can access the movement more easily. So I'm now going to assume that position with our model. And as I said, in this position, you may not be able to see it necessarily, but my hands are a little bit wider rather than close together. So for the rotation movement, we're going to be going to the right and left sides. You may find it easier to test one side first and repeatedly test that side before going on to the other. So for example, we may start by accessing right-sided rotation, and we may test this a couple of times to get a good feel for this movement before attempting left-sided cervical spine rotation. You may also see um, from this position that I'm using my body weight to help my handling. So for example, when we test rotation to the right, I side flex my body towards the right side to ease the movement. And the same is on the other side. When we rotate to the left, me myself, I'm side flexing to the left to make the movement easier. So that's in terms of the movement. Next, we're going to talk about pain, range, and end feel. In terms of pain, it is also that the muscles on the opposite side are on a stretch, and it might be the facet joints or the stretching of those soft tissues that creates the patient's pain. What you can consider is where the patient describes their pain. If the patient describes pain with this movement closer to the joint surfaces of the neck, it may be due to the facet joints, whereas more peripheral pain or more distal pain may be in description of muscular pain. It's also important to consider that the majority of cervical spine rotation occurs from the upper cervical spine. And we can see this because the lower cervical spine is relatively neutral in this position. And therefore, if people report pain, they are more likely to report pain around the upper cervical spine, as this is where rotation occurs, where the lower cervical spine uh, is very stiff and finds it difficult to access um, flexion and rotation movements, this may be even more the case that pain occurs around the upper areas because the upper cervical spine has to work much harder as a result of the lower cervical spine being stiff. The expected range of movement for cervical spine rotation is approximately 80 degrees, and the expected end feel for cervical spine rotation is a soft end feel. However, as we mentioned with uh, conditions such as osteoarthritis, because of closing down of facet joints being more painful, you may have a harder end feel for cervical spine rotation with osteoarthritic patients. Finally, as we did with cervical spine flexion and extension, you can also try and mimic rotation of the cervical spine from different areas to see if this changes the patient's symptoms. So, for example, we can create a fulcrum around the lower cervical spine and try and access more rotation in this position by placing our hands around the lower cervical spine or doing the same for the mid cervical spine to access movement around this region or upper cervical spine to access movement around this region. And again, we're doing these movements to see if this creates differences in pain or range of movement. 
If it does, for example, if there are, is more stiffness around the lower or the mid cervical spine, we may choose to mobilize these areas or encourage our patient to access movement from these areas so that we can reduce their symptoms by increasing range of movement. So finally, we're going to examine cervical spine side flexion. For this movement, the therapist is going to be in the same position behind the patient's head. And our handling is going to be the same as cervical spine rotation, i.e. with our hands in a cradled position around the occiput, but with the hands further apart. So this is the handling that I'm now going to assume with our patient. So in order to take the uh, cervical spine into more of a side flex position, as the therapist, we need to change our body position to make it easier for our hands. And we're also going to test side flexion in one position a few times to get a feel for the movement. So if we start with right-sided side flexion, as the therapist, I'm going to perform a gentle lunge into the right side, and this will help ease the pressure on my hands. As we said, we're going to gently take the patient's cervical spine into side flexion a few times on the right to get an idea of the movement on that side. And then again, we're, we're then going to repeat the same to the left. Again, as a therapist, I perform a gentle lunge and we gently take the cervical spine towards the left to get an idea of how the movement is going. In terms of our pain range and end feel, some of the main structures that are affected with the cervical spine side flexion movement are the facet joints. And in particular, it are, it's the facet joints on the same side that we are side flexing towards, which are closing down. And therefore, this may be where patients report local pain because of that closing down. Particularly for your osteoarthritic patient, where the joint surfaces closing down can be more painful. Your patient may also report increased pain on the opposite side, as this is where soft tissue is stretching. And so if your patient in particular points towards pain further down the upper trapezius or more towards the shoulder joint, this may be the reason for their pain. We also know with cervical spine side flexion that the majority of the movement occurs at the lower cervical spine. And you can see that in this position, there is a much greater angle at the lower cervical spine compared to the upper cervical spine. So patients may be more prone to reporting pain in the lower cervical spine than upper cervical spine with this movement. The expected range of movement for side flexion is 45 degrees, but this can often be limited with your osteoarthritic patient. In terms of end feel, we normally expect end feel to be soft as it is often soft tissue structures which limit movement at the end range. However, as we said for your osteoarthritic patient, because of the early closing down of those facet joints, the end feel may be more hard in nature. Finally, as we have done with our other cervical spine movements, we can try and access side flexion from the upper, middle and lower cervical spine to see if this changes your patient's symptoms. So, for example, we can change our handling and placing our hands more towards the upper cervical spine to create a fulcrum in this position for upper cervical spine side flexion and then place our hands in the mid cervical spine to create a fulcrum for mid cervical spine side flexion. And we can also do the same by placing our hands at the lower cervical spine to try and access lower cervical spine side flexion. And as we said, the reason for doing this is to see if this changes your patient's symptoms. They may report less pain in different areas, or you may feel as the therapist that movement at the upper, middle and lower cervical spine may be more stiff in some areas and may feel more relaxed in other areas. If you do feel that it is more painful uh, with movement in one of those regions or more stiff in one of those regions, you may choose to mobilize that region to open up movement and see if that changes your patient's pain. You can also encourage your patient to try and access movement from the area that is stiff to see if that reduces their pain levels. So to summarize this video on passive range of movement of the cervical spine. Passive range of movement testing of the cervical spine is completed to assess the patient's movement when contractile structures are inactive. In practice, the patient lies in a supine position with the therapist standing behind the head end of the plinth. Take the patient's cervical spine through passive range of flexion, 
extension, rotation and side flexion. Observe pain, range and end feel for each movement. Remember to keep the hands relaxed so that you can feel exactly what is happening with each movement. You may wish to alter your hand position as shown in the video in order to bias the upper, mid or lower cervical spine for each movement to compare any differences in pain or stiffness between each region. And that completes our video on passive range of movement testing of the cervical spine. In practice, you would now compare your patient's active range of movement with their passive range of movement. And by doing so, will allow you to make a decision as to whether it's most likely to be contractile or non-contractile structures which are at fault for their condition. You can use these findings alongside your resisted tests and your palpation and observation to confirm their diagnosis. If you'd like more information on how to interpret the findings of passive and active range of movement, head over to our videos titled Why Test Active Range of Movement and Why Test Passive Range of Movement before you join us again here for the next video. So thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon right here at Clinical Physio.